The text from Genesis that we heard this morning is known as the call story of Abram, a man who eventually becomes Abraham. And it is a call story that in many ways resonates with me. I thought it only fair to give a wider group of you some idea of who I am. And so I am sharing with you my call story. God called me into Christian ministry on the streets of Brooklyn in 1991. I can tell you exactly where I was standing. I was on the corner of 7th Avenue and Union Street. I had just exited the subway and was on my way home. And I said aloud what I had been thinking for some months. I said, maybe I should be a minister. And suddenly, the ground pitched beneath my feet and the building seesawed before my eyes and then locked back into the place. And I was gasping with the clarity of the answer to the question I had posed. I could not believe what I had just experienced and I spoke out loud to the one that I knew was with me in that moment. And I said, okay, let's do it. God literally shook my foundations because I suspect God knew that nothing short of that would have convinced me to enter into this vocation. We have, one hopes, many months and years for you to hear the stories of the strange path that led me to ministry, but suffice it to say that if in my high school they had voted on the person least likely to be ordained, I would have been on the short list. That doesn't always matter to God, though. And so we fast forward 10 months, and I found myself in seminary. And it was there that I was introduced to scripture in a way that I had never understood it. I entered into what the theologian Karl Barth calls the strange new world of the Bible. Texts that I thought I knew, I realized I did not know at all. And soon after, I realized that this biblical narrative from Hebrew scripture to the gospel story is a story of God's ongoing relationship with humanity, the creator calling to creation. It is a story of ups and downs and highs and lows. There is faith and folly and sin and redemption and the sacred and the profane. There is exodus and freedom, there are people who are broken and beautiful and blessed, and very often they are the same person. And there is this back and forth between God and humanity. Time and time again, God calling ordinary people to do extraordinary things for which they did not necessarily feel prepared for. And it is a narrative that is driven forward, story by story, book by book, by people who said yes. They said yes. Abram. Abram is the first one to say yes. Abram, who is the patriarch, the person that we understand to be the founder of the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all turn to Abraham as their common father. We know him as the one who has shaped all things, but in this moment, at this time in his life, he was simply Abram, a faithful, let me be clear, old man with a barren wife and very few prospects and a culture that judged success by how many children you produced. Abram did not have generation after generation to follow him. He did not see his own future writ in the faces of his children and grandchildren. Instead, his role was defined by his community. He was Abram, and his identity was constructed by the land on which he lived and the lineage with which he was a part of. This is all he had, and against this backdrop, God comes to him and says, go. Go. In the King James Bible, it puts it quite beautifully. The King James Version has this text say, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. Get thee out. 
I would be a little afraid if those were the words I had heard. Instead, we read the translation, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Go to the land that I will show you. Now, for those of you who are English majors, and I think I met a couple of you yesterday, and I know that if I get this wrong, you will correct me. Have mercy. This phrase, go to the land that I will show you, is known in English majors' terms as a future conditional tense, meaning there is an if and a then to this statement. If you go, then I will show you. There is nothing guaranteed in this moment, neither on Abram's side or God's side, if then, if you go, I will show you. And do you hear that there aren't very many specifics? There's just this vague, astonishing promise, unbelievable, if you will, that out of this old man and his barren wife, God intends to make of them a great nation and a name that will never be forgotten. Really? This man is old. This man has no children. This man only has his father's house and the land on which he resides, and God says, go. Implicit in this statement from the holy is the word, trust me. Or more aptly put, do you trust me? Do you trust me? So Abram, a faithful man with everything to lose, goes. And so begins with Abram's faithful stepping out, this lineage of faithful actors, people who time and time again make choices that don't in the moment seem altogether rational, but they are compelled by a faith and the sound of God's voice and the idea that there might be something more, the undiscovered country, the land that I will show you. And you know what? Abram is not the only one who takes such chances. Think back through what you know of Scripture. Ruth and Hannah, Elijah and Samuel, David and Jacob and Mary. They all step out. They all take chances. They hear the word of God calling them to something unexpected, and they go. These are all men and women who don't know precisely what is coming, the nature of the blessing. They only know that they have faith in the one who sends them, who's speaking, go. Well, these are inspiring stories. I love these Bible stories. And they're great for Sunday school, but I don't really live like this on a Monday. Sundays are good, and I can speak a big game about being faithful and stepping out in faith and doing what God calls me to do, but really, let's be honest with ourselves, I'm not sure any of us live this way day to day in the real world. I mean, it's unrealistic, it's rather impractical, isn't it? I did not want to hedge my bets about whether or not I would feel called to you and you would feel called to me. But I have to admit that I started looking online for a house. (laughs) Just a little. But once you go down that rabbit hole that is known as Zillow and you start scrolling through (laughs) all the houses that are there, I'm just amazed. I'm amazed what you can learn from Zillow. And I discovered that I would see a house that was kind of in the right neighborhood and it kind of had the right number of bedrooms and the right number of bathrooms. And then there would be these gorgeous pictures and some of them so professional and some of them, oh my gosh, not professional. And they were all fairly fascinating and told me more about the house. But every once in a while, I would see a house that fit my needs and I would click on the address, and there were no photos, no pictures. And my response is, well, what are you hiding? What don't you want me to see? What's wrong with your house that you haven't put pictures on Zillow? It was as if the seller was saying, trust me, it's a great house. Really? Pass. I'm not interested in seeing a house that you won't show pictures to on Zillow because the truth is, I am like so many of you. We want to know. We think it's just the right thing to do. We don't make plans suddenly or rationally. We do not act out of character. No, we plan, we research, we fact check, 
We call the references, we interview the candidates, we run the numbers and make sure all of this makes sense. We are unaccustomed, my friends, or maybe just unwilling to take much on faith in real life. But I wonder some days, maybe we should be a little more daring. Because isn't the life of faith that Jesus calls us to something that is not just lived in this sanctuary? Not just lived on the youth mission trip, not just a moment when you're serving at the food pantry. Isn't the life of faith life? When Jesus said, I come to give you life and give it abundantly, he wasn't just talking about what it was like in the pews. He was talking about all of life. All of our lives are of interest to God, and God is present in them. We just don't act like it much of the time. The other thing we realize when we hear these stories of Abram and all the others who came after him is that the narrative of Scripture is propelled forward by people who said yes. They're the only ones who show up in the story for the most part. Now, I'm sure there were plenty of people who said no. People that God spoke to and they're like, no, 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 no. This if-then stuff is not for me. Many more people like the story of the rich young man who comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looks at him and says, my dear son, sell everything you have and give the money to the poor and then you can follow me. And he says no. The young man walks away in mourning because he had many possessions or things that possessed him. He said no. And the truth is, because of free will, we all have the ability to say no, but the story of the good news of Jesus Christ is moved by people who say yes. And God always hopes that we won't. And so now we come to Matthew. The end of Matthew. And here we have these plucky few remaining disciples. It says right out at the start that there are 11. Judas is no more. Their numbers are not swelled by all who gathered around Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem. They're down to 11. This plucky band of followers and Jesus calls them to the mountain, which is always the place of revelation, and he gives them the Great Commission which is really just echoing the call story of Abram. Jesus speaks to them and says, Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach all these people to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I will be with you to the end of the age. Once again, like Abram, It is a great and grand commission, but it is short on details. In his commentary on the book of Matthew, the writer and preacher Tom Long notes that the go that Jesus says to his disciples is the same voice that said to Abram, go from your country. This is the voice that said to Moses, go and I will send you to Pharaoh to free my people. The same voice spoke to Isaiah in the temple and said, go and say to my people, now this voice speaks to these mere 11 mortals and says, go and spread the word. Long notes that this is no small thing, that this is no small thing. Not only do they have to baptize them, bring them into this community, this family of Christ, but that they have to teach them to obey And long notes, the church is to go out to the nations, not as an army of occupation, but as a humble tutor, teaching mercy and righteousness, forgiveness and peacemaking. Go. I wonder what they thought, those 11. Wait, how? Where? What are we supposed to do? What resources are we going to use? Go. What do you mean, go? Matthew does not record the questions. There must have been some. But somewhere they found the answers, because here we are, 2,000 years later, doing the same things those first disciples were called to do, making disciples of all nations, baptizing in the triune name of God, and teaching people the power, the abundant life of mercy and righteousness, forgiveness, and peacemaking. It's astonishing. 
Like Abram, those disciples set out on a journey. Like Abram, they were able to do this with just a little bit of faith. Remember, some doubted. And the promise that God, that Jesus Christ would be with them. I cannot help but marvel at their courage and wonder at this magnificent story that is told in Matthew, and then I realize that the story of the disciples is our story, too. I said yes to God's call all those years ago. And in the past 25 years, I have said yes over and over again and been sent into undiscovered country and unexpected places and have found myself able to work with people for the gospel and to bless and be blessed in return. God time and time again has led me to new places and shown me new things, but first I've had to step. And so have you. I believe that God has led me to this moment. It's unpredicted to me, and I am surprised as anyone else. I believe that God has called me here to be part of this community of Christ, the People's Church. You are unknown to me. You look delightful. You clean up pretty well. <laughs> but I am also unknown to you. You have my picture such as it is, professionally taken like the best ones on Zillow, and you know where I came from and what my background is, but the truth is we are being asked to step out in faith. Go, says God, to this church and to this pastor. Go to the place that I will show you. I have felt the Spirit move. I have heard God's call, and I believe we are called in this moment to set off on a new chapter in the life of this church. Like those first disciples, like Abram, we do not know what, we do not know how, we sometimes don't even know why, but friends, we know who. We know who is speaking, who has gathered us, and who has formed us to be the people God means us to be. The only question left to answer is will we say yes? Amen.